the Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Dash Technology Group, ABN 93603 824 835, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to Your Next Client Is You, an ensemble podcast series dedicated to revolutionising financial advice practices with technology. Each episode, we're peeling back the layers of tech implementation, guided by the real-life experiences of a diverse group of advice practitioners. Whether you're tech-savvy or just beginning, they've been where you are, researching, choosing, and triumphing in the tech maze. So, are you ready for insights and inspiration to revamp your practice? Then let's dive in. Are you looking to introduce unprecedented efficiency in your practice? Dash solves the entire spectrum of advice delivery, allowing you to streamline your practice in ways you haven't been able to before. Automate your execution from customized websites to CRMs, modeling, and SOA generation, executed straight into the Dash investment platform. We offer an array of in-house apps and collaborate with third-party vendors to bring you the best solutions. Curious about what your peers have accomplished in their practices with Dash and our integration partners? Have a listen to some practice insights that are sure to get you thinking. Hello and welcome to this very special Ensemble podcast mini-series where we apply the five-stage advice process we all know so well to help select the technology we use to serve our clients. We're gaining these insights through the experience of advice practitioners from within the Ensemble network along with insights from experts within Dash. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and the guests joining me here today are Andrew Grinsel from Cooey Wealth Partners, Jamie Arden from Kofkin Bond & Co, and Nigel Baker from Arch Capital and Centium. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having Thanks, us. Everyone. Now, Thanks, we do have three of you on, <laughs> on this episode here, so we're going to get do our best to cover everybody. But for context, this is episode two of the tech series, and we're focusing on the research stage of investigating possible technology partners. And for some of us early on in our tech careers may have found we skipped the research stage because we went from being overexcited about some tech and just implementing it. This is a really important step in the process. So we're going to go through what each of the gents here have done in that respect and sort of learn from their experience. Now, we did cover this off in episode one, but just to ensure the listener has a bit of context for each of your experiences, what I'd love to know, and let's start with you, Andrew, did the decision to sort of implement a new piece of to- technology come out of a particular challenge your team faced? Do you know, what was it and what problem were you trying to solve? Yeah, absolutely. So, the Kui Wealth Partners business is actually part of a, a broader group called the Kui Group, where we've got property accounting, mortgage broking, uh, and, and each of those businesses had their own CRM. So that meant we had siloed information, uh, we had double entry of data, uh, the, the client experience was not exactly seamless from area to area. So we we're really trying to solve that and find a, um, a tech solution that would be able to cover all parts of the Kui Group business. Yeah, and sort of bring all that together, right? So it's sort of trying to find that thing that's the glue between all of the silos you currently have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just from, from client information through to, to the workflows, um, it, all of it was um, it was really just spread out across different CRMs, uh, which meant that we had clients sort of having to, you know, they'd tell mortgages one thing and then we'd go and have a, a financial advice review and we'd be asking the same questions uh, of the clients. And obviously, that's not an ideal client experience. So, we want to try and get rid of that problem and uh, be in a position where it was one one CRM, one database uh, that uh, really captured everything about our clients and the, the journey they were going on through different parts of the business. Perfect. Now, Jamie, for you, what was the trigger for you when it came in, you know, came to picking a new piece of technology or looking at that? What was the challenge or problem you faced in the business? Yeah, reflecting on what Andrew said, so, so same thing, you know, multiple, di- different departments um, all getting the same bits of information and all entering it 
you know, twice. So when we're trying to move it between workflows, we were trying to use technology with, that we thought suited us best for that sort of area of the business. And with, if it was the client experience, if it was research, however, however we were dealing with that, yeah, we felt like we were double entering data consistently. So even just names down to something as simple as that, um, rekeying those details in. Now, it might be only a small saving, but it, it just also just doesn't frustrate staff if they're not having to repeat that same information and feeling like they're sort of sitting in a corner just keying in data all day. Yeah, grumpy staff is not a good thing. I'm always a fan for any tech implementation that can help with grumpy staff. Now, Nigel, your situation is a little different, isn't it? So what triggered your you know, embarking out into the market looking for a solution? Yeah, Peter, um, I suppose from Arch Capital's point of view, we were looking at a way to help um, those clients for accounting and financial planning businesses that didn't quite need full advice yet, but we um, wanted to create, a, I suppose, a similar journey and experience that could lead them to advice or lead them to information and, and sort of solve that gap, that advice gap that's been talked about so much for the last couple of years. But I suppose this journey started six or so years ago and trying to create that, you know, there's all sorts of words, whether it's digital or robo-advice, or what does that really mean and how can we how can we provide a great client experience and lead people through a, a journey that may not require full advice or perhaps could lead to full advice, but importantly, stay connected with that, that trusted advisor. So um, there was nothing in the marketplace that really solved that. And um, yeah, we've been working away to try to see if we can um, build that through the, the CNTM business. So to put it in a category then, it's sort of like, a, I mean, the expression is LMS, isn't it? But like a learning management system yeah. or something that, that sort of takes people on a journey to, to learn and self-explore. Is that fair? Yeah, exactly. And in the context of financial advice and all the complications around that and compliance and the like, and, and can that lead to them self-selecting? Can it lead them to um, being part of a, a sort of an ecosystem and a group? And, and where, do, where, where do you draw a line between advice and non-advice and all those issues in, that the industry face? So. Yeah, absolutely. So then, you know, for you, Andrew, then really, if we would categorize the tech, what, well, it sounds like it's just a CRM thing that you were embarking on. That was what you're looking at. But it turns out it became much more than that, didn't it? It impacted a whole lot more choices you had to make. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you start looking for a CRM that's going to lend itself to all parts of the business, it means that you're probably moving away from a CRM that is a dedicated financial planning CRM. And That then means that uh, it's you know it's going to be a CRM and only a CRM, uh, and then it needs to be able to talk to or connect to uh, the other parts that we need for advice delivery. So we ended up needing to get new um, document generation software. We needed um, you know new new modelling. We needed to be able to um, do insurance product research, superannuation product research. So it certainly did broaden. I think we ended up introducing about five new pieces of technology <laughs> into the advice delivery process, but um, it, uh, yeah, it certainly turned into a more than just a journey for a new CRM. But how about you, Jamie? Was yours, did you manage to keep yours fairly concise? Was it really down to that sort of core CRM or did you find you ended up having to look at some other alternatives as well? So, so with the problem we actually faced is we were using too much, too many pieces of technology. So ours was actually about reducing the amount of technology that we we're using, or using that technology in a more concise way. So, you know, how could we have data flow effectively between those different pieces of technology? Because, you know, I think Andrew reflected on in our industry, financial services and, and financial planning. You know, there's modeling tools that you need to use, and there's research tools that you need to use. And and when you're looking at it, you're wanting to use the most accurate. Uh, tools and you want to use the best of best of breed. So for us, it was about continuing to use the best bits of technology, but having it in one ecosystem. So that was our journey. It, it was it was sort of, you know, we knew what we wanted to use. We knew the technology sort of pieces that we wanted to plug together, but it was how we were going to plug them together um, effectively. And I guess for particularly for Jamie and Andrew, but it could even be Nigel. What's interesting here is often it's it's not about, you know, systems that are villains versus heroes. This is not, oh, this one's universally bad and this one's good. It's about where you are at in the business, right? That's what determines these choices. So you just have evolved, you know, your business has evolved over time and the tech you might have used back then just isn't necessarily going to do the trick right now. Yeah, and the problem we faced with that was that we would – want to use another bit of technology and then all of a sudden we had to migrate all of our data or we had to sort of stop using one and spend a heap of time sort of getting everything across and training up where now what we're finding um, through that process is, hey, you can actually probably use 
this bit of technology, but push the data that you already have into it. So that's sort of how we've got around our research in sort of finding a solution. Yeah, nice. And is that, we, um, um, yeah, Andrew, actually, has that been your experience? Yeah, so what happened with us is we did have, uh, or we started primarily as a financial planning business, and we did have a piece of technology that was suitable for financial planning. And then as the business grew and we ended up with a mortgages business and an accounting business and then a property business, uh, we were still trying to run out of the same piece of technology. So it was that growth that the business was going through that sort of rendered uh, the, the existing technology as being not exactly suitable for what where the business was at. Yeah. And it's, and I think it's a point worth making because I, you know, on the, even on the ensemble platform, you'll see a a lot of people come out of, Oh, what do you think of this tech? Or should I be using this one? And, and what is rarely put in place is the context of why they're asking that because, you know, each of you could be looking for the same category of tech, but you're each going to approach it very differently because you have very different businesses. So, I mean, and Nigel, yours is particularly unusual because it was something completely out. I mean, it doesn't meet advice tech category at all, does it, what you guys were looking for? So, it's a whole new world in terms of researching and trying to find a solution. Yeah, exactly, Peter. There's nothing on the that existed at the time, so we uh, we had to sort of start looking out into other industries and see what what else might apply and what we could maybe modify to bring into financial services. Yeah, yeah. And to that point, then, you know, I mean, you you couldn't just have googled learning management. Well, maybe you did learning management <laughs> system and start with a big old list because actually there is a big list if anybody ever does Google that. I'm wondering. What was unique about you guys and what you were looking for that you kept in mind when you were looking for the right solution? Like, what were the elements, the key things that you wanted to make sure that you had? Yeah, I mean, there's, I suppose there's, there's a lot there to talk about, but in, in simple terms, it was we wanted to keep it, you know, as simple as, simple as possible. Uh, we know that businesses have already got a lot of tech things going on, so how can we bring something in that isn't going to um, look and feel like, for example, a CRM or a platform, but something more client facing. So I think when, when we changed our discussion around, well, it's really about the client. So what, what would a client use as opposed to maybe a business use and see if that works first? And then hopefully if that works, then bring it back to reverse engineer it and say, well, then it might plug into, uh, and it is new. It's not a, you know, we're not a, a CRM or a, or a, a competitor to a, a robo advice platform or a, or a rap platform. It's, it's something quite new, which has got its own challenges, obviously. It does. And, and I guess, um, while not many people would be building something that they might use within their own business, but then make available to other advisors. I mean, it is a quite an unusual example. What I think is mm. interesting about that is that feature of effectively white labeling a solution would have become, would have become a really key thing you were looking for when you were going out to market, right? Like that becomes a, that yeah, must have yeah. narrowed down the list significantly. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and interestingly, in our learning path, when we first had a sort of a, a test case uh, available to show to advisors, it wasn't fully white label. Like it was, it was in the plans, but it wasn't. And as soon as we flipped that switch and made it white label, then that really opened the doors a lot. So, yeah, really learning from you know what advisors wanted. They certainly wanted white label. They wanted to have more bespoke options. They wanted it to look and feel like them, and uh, be able to have their own. Even at the end of the piece, their own investment solutions as well. So. We learned a lot along the path and then how to make sure that the technology can mould to that, which um, has been sort of adapting as we go as well. Right, exactly. Now, Jamie, for you, you know, for your business, then were there any, you know, other key elements that you had to keep in mind as, you know, either features or part of your business when you were looking for that tech solution? Was there anything you just that meant some things did get knocked off the list? Yeah, so we were looking at growth. So we're, we're in a position in the company at the moment where we're trying to grow. Um, we're trying to sort of open new departments. As we're talking about mortgage broken, we've opened accounting. So those areas of the business. So we were from traditional financial planning. So again, yeah, we had technology that worked for us, but we knew we were expanding into other areas. So within the research stage of it, it's okay, what other platforms from these industries are they using? What CRMs are they using? What you know research technology are they using? And will these technologies be open to working with others in the future? So you know there's some great technologies out there that sort of don't have any open architecture and it's you know if you decide to use them, well you've got to use them by themselves. So that's sort of a key part for us is thinking forward, thinking of other industries and thinking sort of now what might happen in the future. So finding also partners that uh, are willing to keep building and, and that are growing themselves. So our, our idea around technology that we're using was finding a partner that's 
looking to expand as well and that's sort of not holding a monopoly in a sense and like mm-hmm. you know we've done our job and we're going to sort of stay here um one that was going to grow with us yeah, that nimble thing is really important, isn't it? You want them to sort yeah. of still be on the hunt, right? Still looking to add new features and keep up or even keep ahead. Um, the last thing you want is that's is sort of a passive solution um, because yeah. it's just not going to work, is it? And the big thing for us was also finding a team that we could talk to because I think, you know, when, you, when you're talking large technology plays, then you sort of almost get to a point where you've got someone that's sort of your BDM that's looking after you in regards to if you have a problem, send it through here and we'll fix, this, fix that. But, you know, we're looking for solutions moving forward. So I want to talk to their team. I want to talk to their, you know, um, developers and I want to see what we can achieve in the future. For sure. So then – Look, I'm, I'm actually a bit curious in terms of operational constraints then, like going a bit narrower down into that. Then, you know, Andrew, for you, it sounds like um, the constraints came about, you know, some of it was this silo operations that you were trying to bring into into one place. What else was a constraint you either had to respond to quickly or, or adjust for as you were sort of doing the digging and you realized how much work was involved? A big thing that we had to look for was that open architecture that uh, Jamie touched on there because if you're going down the path of using a dedicated CRM and it doesn't have a lot of the other things that we need in advice or in mortgage broking or in accounting, you've got to make sure that the CRM or you know, it does talk to uh, the other solutions that you're going to have. So if we were... You know, engaging with people who looked like they had a great platform, but it was you know closed architecture. And unfortunately, we just we couldn't use it. It wasn't going to work for us in a business where we need to be able to plug in different things as the business continues to grow and evolve. Uh, much like Jamie, yeah, for sure. And um, so, for Nigel, for you, what was one of the key operational constraints for you that you guys had to keep in mind as you sort of looked at options out in the market? Yeah, I mean, we didn't. We sort of went in um, pretty, pretty blind, Peter. We didn't know what we're doing. We just, you know, we just, see what happens. We thought, let's uh, let's go flip from advice to try to build a tech business on the side, and and um, as and you really, do, you know, yeah. So why not? Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's been a complete eye opener. Like we didn't know what our, you know, now we sort of have a better idea about what our constraints, but that seems to change every day. Um, but it's really yeah, the capability and just trying to find the right sort of partners out there and, and, and what those resources are. And, you know, and there's just, there's, there's lots of them. So like the part of it is just keeping a bit of a focus on relationships and people you, you, you know, you can work with. And, and again, like what Jamie and Andrew said, people you, you know, can grow with you and build out a solution that we might not have yet, but be willing to give it a go. Yeah, I mean, I'm betting we'll get to costs later, but I'm betting that one of the things when you're building something as opposed to just selecting and implementing, then mm. I'm betting, you know, upfront capital cost is probably a constraint. You know, there's a big yeah, difference in terms of yeah. what it's going to cost for some of these tools, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Obviously, it's a given. It's just as a, you can see. Yeah. Spend a lot, a lot of money. <laughs> you're not careful. So you're gonna, and really good, like, like <laughs> serious mo- house money. Like yeah. serious money, absolutely. Yeah. I'm actually curious, Jamie, for you because um, you operate within, I believe, within a dealer group in terms of. So you don't have your own license. Is that correct? So, so how did you handle those constraints and the you know requirements they might have, or or sign offs or anything like that that sort of impacted the choices you were making? Yeah, so that process, and we actually changed while we were in the middle of this process, we actually changed licensees, so that created new challenges in itself. But, wow. you know, it was about having an open conversation. Look, the deal group we're under is Count, and, and I work closely with Reg, and so that was actually an open conversation and going to the team and sitting down with them to say, hey, this is what we're looking at doing and this is what we're looking to achieve. And so we were sort of given um, – I guess an allowance to work within a framework. So I, for me, it was actually a nice thing because I actually had some guidance above me to say, hey, you know, you're probably going outside the lines a little bit and you're probably going to, you know, create problems for yourself. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've made mistakes in the past with technology and you were talking about sort of the process of spending money. You know, there's a lot of technologies out there, especially US-based technologies that you pay for 12-month subscriptions or you're locked into contracts. And so if it doesn't work out, then you're sort of stuck for a period of time. So... For me, it sort of actually provided a bit more guidance um, and we've worked closely together to cr- try and create solutions that will not help just us but help others as well. And it's an interesting point actually because I think lots of us, you know, we, we do get a bit wary with dealing with a deal group where you feel like maybe you wait until you've made a decision. Like you might wait until, okay, I've found the one, I'll go and <laughs> tell them and go, hey, is this okay? Whereas I think that's a great suggestion is, you know, involve them earlier on because you don't know what they know. 
or who they've interacted with or insights they can bring you or mistakes they can save you from making. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and and that's that's the ones that they have done for me is, you know, there's actually been bits of technology that I've thought are great solutions and what they've done is actually help me go do the DD process on them and make sure, you know, security is up to speed with it. So there's a bit of technology we've just implemented and security just, you know, wasn't right when we first found them um, and counts actually helped them get to the level where the security is now up to scratch and yeah. they're comfortable to tick it off. So, you know, I haven't had to put in all the resources into doing that process. So I've been able to sort of have them do it for me. Awesome. And, and I mean, you all sort of mentioned it, but you're very much, um, you know, it sounds like all of you were looking for something that could fit in an ecosystem as opposed to, I want this one thing that does everything for the business. I mean, I, it's still there's some big systems you're each describing there in terms of the involvement in the practice, but it sounds like that whole plug and play mentality is where you've got each of you to. Is that valid? Andrew, you guys have got to the point where it's like, yes, we need to be able to plug, you know, down the track, plug a new system in for something else and it will just fit within the ecosystem. Is that valid? Yeah, that's right. I mean, each part of the Kui group is going to have its own specific needs. So trying to find one bit of technology that was going to be able to cover everything that's needed across all areas, just it wasn't going to happen. I mean, one way that we did try and look at it is, do we go and get an end-to-end advice solution that then has the ability to feed up to an overarching CRM across all business units? And, you know, the advice team just uses that all-in-one solution as the primary CRM, or do we all sit up in the same CRM and then plug in different uh, technology solutions for different parts of the advice process. And uh, it was one of the the key decisions that we had to go through and make. And uh, our preference ended up lying with going for something that was able to sort of plug in to an overall tech stack because then we can replace those bits and pieces that we need to as the business grows and evolves uh, without having to rip the whole thing up and start again. Yeah, absolutely. And I figure, Nigel, what you guys have uh, pulled together, then that's the same idea is this is not designed to replace everything. This is a solution that that can then form part of your bigger tech ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. Yeah, it's something that that plugs in for those firms and businesses wanting to solve for those sort of clients. Not all do, but for those that do, it's it's not going to do everything. It's not going to wash the dishes, but it also does provide a gap for those clients. Yeah. And I'm curious, Jamie, for you then, you know, because your business, like you say, you're growing and, and, um, this has been a bit of an evolution. Then was there a time though in the past where your temptation would have been, we want one thing that does everything? Cause it's quite a natural instinct for advisors. I mean, every time I present on tech, it's the question I get, but Peter, what's the one system I can get for all of it? Is that been, has that ever been a moment in your past where you sort of quietly wished, I wish I could get just one thing? Yeah, I think that's everyone's dream to get one thing that does it all. Um, but I think, you know, there's players in the market that have, have done that and it's created its own challenges. So yeah. as I was discussing before, finding that one solution, if they hold the monopoly, then, you know, they're probably not as motivated to keep being nimble and to keep bringing on new bits of technology. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're seeing everything evolve quickly. The, the thing that's on the top of everyone's tongue is AI at the moment and you know, everyone's looking at how they can implement that. But, you know, I don't think we need to rush into things, but we also need to explore different bits and different areas. So yeah. for me, it's probably, I've probably been a person that sort of rebelled against the one system and, and sort of tried to find an area where I can use, you know, a central point and then explore out from there. So um, probably that decision happened about seven years ago and I probably haven't stopped on that journey since. Yeah. And given how, look, how many systems there are now in advice, but also outside of advice, you know, to Nigel's point with what they've gone looking for, there's so much out there that we're blindly ignorant of. Um, you know, if you can build something that just lets you add pieces that make sense, you know, for your moment in your business, it's so powerful what you could end up building. It could be really something quite magical. I'm a little curious actually then because the word, the well, expression CRM has come up a, up a bit and it's something that I think can be a bit misunderstood in our game. So, Andrew, it sounds like, you know, as you were researching and discovering the options that you had out there that you were considering, you looked at advice CRMs and then sort of business, I guess, broad, broader business CRMs um, and compared them. Did it become clear to you that what we think are CRMs and advice is quite different to what the rest of the <laughs> industries out there think CRMs are? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, when we think of CRMs, we think you know, in advice, we think of uh, systems that, yes, they hold the client information, but they also hold uh, things like you know, it's where we do our modeling, it's where we do our product research, it's our document yeah. storage system. 
all of those things aren't actually a CRM. A CRM itself is really just the the client database and you know, it can include your tasks and your workflows. Mm-hmm. And that's about it. It's how you re- manage the relationship with your clients, client yeah. relationship manager. It's not a modeling system. It's not everything else that has been bundled into uh, advice CRMs over the years. Yeah, absolutely. And therefore, I'm betting you went to some of the, you took a look at some of the big players out there, you know, in terms of the broader business CRMs um, and, and you know, compared them, you know, against the other options you had. Was that sort of the process you went to? Did you just sort of go and, and interact with all of them and find out what they could provide? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it resulted in us looking at the established um, CRMs, uh, as we call them in the advice space, but also the CRMs that you would see used across other industries, uh, completely yeah. unrelated industries. You know, uh, some of these CRMs get used in, you know, automotive industry, in um, you know, travel, uh, hospitality. It's you know the CRMs that aren't necessarily um, industry specific. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think what's interesting is whenever you do go outside, you know, the advice world for those solutions, you. A, the interaction is quite different because the group that you're interacting with don't necessarily know, automatically know your business, but that can be some interesting pushback for you when, you, when you're talking about, say, the workflows and they're like, but why are you doing it that way? Like, you know, you could just do this, you know, so there's not some assumptions in the way things need to work. So, I bet that was a bit of a process to sort of- It is, but it goes both ways because we also get stuck in a sort of status quo in the way that we th- do things in advice because it's how mm-hmm. it's always been done. And sometimes mm-hmm. we can learn a lot from what's going on in other industries and how they actually interact and engage with clients. So, being able to actually um, look at the CRM perspective from uh, or look at the CRM from an outside perspective and how, you know, take some insights from other industries was actually quite helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Nigel, did you find the same? So when you were going out and you were checking out all of these different um, systems, did you find that it actually, wow, we didn't realise that these things were capable of doing that and it sort of almost changed your approach potentially? Yeah, absolutely. I was just about to say on Andrew's point that um, when we were dealing with providers in our industry, it was almost getting too hard and it was almost going to ruin the the dream of building this out. So when we started to talk to people outside the financial services industry about what we're trying to do, then the solution was a lot easier to find and a lot (laughs) cheaper to find. And they sort of looked at me and said, well, it's not that hard. Like, But when I was talking to people in the financial service industry and they were complicating it with this really complicated compliance overlay and CRMs and what the X-Plans of the world did and they're thinking that's what we're trying to build. Right. And that was going to cost me, you know, squillions of dollars versus tech people who had a totally fresh perspective and said, oh, we can build that and, you know, when do you want it next week sort of thing? And I'm oh, well, thinking uh, it just wasn't going to be possible. So I really did by just going outside and starting fresh and just talking about what we want from a – you know, a customer journey rather than forget about financial services, then it, it really opened up some doors for us. Yeah. yeah, it certainly does, doesn't it? Jamie, I'm curious for you guys then, you know, how did you go about coming up with the list that you were researching, discovering all the different options? Well, you know, how, who did you reach out to? How did you start to build that sort of, I guess, the beauty parade list of people that you'd consider? Yeah, I've probably, reflecting on what Nigel was talking about, I've probably sort of surrounded myself from people with the outside the industry. So, actually gone and spoken to people who have built technology before, sold technology before, or involved in new builds, um, and just inquired to them, their thoughts on things. And, and also, if I, you know, get one person telling me something, I, I try to validate it by somebody else as well. So, you know, making sure that I'm just not going off one opinion and, and running with it. Um, I've made mistakes in the past of, you know, jumping into things too early as I was talking about around subscriptions and, you know, now I probably take a lot more time in that research process to talk to different people from outside the industry and inside the industry um, and reflect on sort of, you know, what, what each have said because sometimes we do overcomplicate it and within our industry we do add extra layers for sometimes, you know, reasons that we don't need to get into. Um, so sometimes it's nice to get a fresh perspective and, and a really simple perspective. And, you know, I've got someone, I've got Kevin who I lean on, um, Leal from Dash who I lean on around research um, and for him, he sort of, you know, provides a clear picture for me. I ring him with an idea and, you know, why are you actually trying to achieve that, Jamie? Oh, because of these are, yeah, but is that actually going to provide you the solutions that you're after? Oh, probably not actually. <laughs> um, so he's probably the guy that sort of hits a few things on the head for me and I don't rush off and spend money. So he's, he's someone good that I reflect with. Yeah. The um, outside the industry thing I think is really important. I've been going for years for the last 
maybe it's not quite 10 years, but going to US conferences. But in particular, I started to go, would you believe, to some CRM conferences, so some business CRM conferences, things like Salesforce or their competitors, you know, people like that are just going to their annual conference. And people are like, really, you want to go to a conference about an external CRM? And it was about seeing what other industries are doing. I think we mistakenly think that we're the only legislated industry out there, and we're really not. You know, trucking, all these people have all sorts of rules and regs they've got to operate within, and they've worked out how to use systems to make that easier. So, you know, get forcing yourself to question all of that, I think, is really valuable um, and can, like Nigel's you saying, is delivering much better outcomes if we stop using the way we do it now as the sort of the base that you grow from, you know, if you can really second guess that. Now, cost. <laughs> so, Something that is probably a bit of a pet peeve for all of us, and I get it, is the cost of technology and particularly when you've got layers of tech that you're putting in place. Um, I'm curious for each of you, and let's, Andrew, start with you, you know, how much did that sort of monthly charge, you know, play a part? Um, Did, you know, was it something that was a key focus or did you focus more on researching the solution and then go, okay, well, how much is it going to be and therefore consider the options? Yeah, so we were very conscious not to compare what our previous cost structure was to what we were going to because the the previous cost structure was for a solution that didn't really serve its purpose. So it wasn't really appropriate to benchmark against that. So what we did is we did have a look at what the ideal solution is. And there are a couple of providers that did come back to us uh, that, you know, we were looking at it going, this can work. We can, we can build something here and it's going to be right. And once we had those providers and we put together our comparisons around, you know, what can they do? What are the costs going to be and different bits and pieces? At the end of the day, there was a large consideration around cost. Um, One of the providers that we were looking at was going to require quite substantial development work uh, to be able to get it to the standard that we were going to need it to be. And that was going to you know, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we sort of thought, <laughs> well, um, maybe we won't go down that path. Whereas the solution we ended up going with, whilst it you know, was sort of a, a multidisciplinary CRM that wasn't constrained to financial services, as a business that actually has taken that CRM and converted it into uh, a financial services CRM for part of it. But the rest of the business that's not financial planning doesn't have to use that part. So that certainly did help drive our own decision. It's an interesting question, Nigel. I'm curious for you because um, you're not just choosing a platform or a tech solution. You also may, you will have had some development costs. So that's there's some balance in that, isn't there? Because one could be higher and cause the other to be lower. So how did you manage that tension between the development cost itself versus the technology? Yeah, Peter, it's um, certainly been an interesting journey. Like of how, or what parts do we, we need to develop, which parts we could plug in, which ones we could lean on in industry. So it's been a bit of a combination of those. Um um, and certainly had some misfires as well. So we started off with some groups and had to quickly try and get out of it. And a bit like what you were saying about before, Jamie, I was, you know, constantly looking at things out there and signing up to something to see if that would work and trialing it. And so there's a, bit, a lot of trial and error and you've got to be careful that you don't, you know, waste time and money on some of those solutions. So um, fortunately, you know, through some trial and error, found some really good tech partners that were, um, really good to work with and reasonable and practical of what we're trying to do. So that that's that's helped us. But we, you know, we didn't start there. We started with some poor um, experiences and sort of evolved to get there, which is probably always going to be the way. The first uh, first one's not always the right one, so to speak. But um, yeah. absolutely. And I guess because it's not just upfront people cost or development costs. There's also some, and something we've become really conscious about when we're choosing tech is what's the benefit in people costs. So, you know, what are the, what are the dollars of the person we won't have to hire because we're using this? Because, you know, the system may cost a bit. But if you don't have to spend 10 times that for another person in the team, then, wow, that's worth it. You know, so, Jamie, I'm curious for you, is that what was the focus on, you know, how did you handle that dynamic and what was the focus on cost for your project? Yeah, look, I think I've, I've got great partners that are, are willing to invest in technology. So, you know, we know that there's probably going to be mistakes along the way. Um, and, you know, we can look back and say that cost us, but at least we understand that we're trying to get to a better solution. And, and ours definitely probably isn't about 
cutting costs of a, a staff member in that sense, but also seeing what more relatable work that they can do. You know, can they spend more time with clients? Can they bring on more clients? So for us, it's about providing them efficiencies in their day. So, you know, not having grumpy staff that are working on mundane tasks that they can't stand. Um, it's actually getting to the work that we want to do as advisors. So, yeah, look, I, I've been lucky in the sense of I've made mistakes as we've discussed, um, but those mistakes also lead, and Nigel's sort of saying, it's also led me to actually meet some great people um, and, and find better solutions. So sometimes there is a cost to doing business, as we sort of say, um, and so I've enjoyed that journey. But we, we've been able to actually reduce costs in technology um, yep. by this journey now. Um, we haven't built out any of our own IP or anything like that. Um, we've used sort of products out there, but, you know, we've definitely been able to reduce now um, and are in contracts and agreements that we are comfortable with um, and that also allow us to pivot. So, um, you know, cost, cost is something that should always be considered, but you've got to find that solution first and work back from there. And that bandwidth thing is really, really valuable, isn't it? If you can unlock some bandwidth in the team and who's to say where it goes. So some of it could be revenue generating, but some of it could just be in enthusiasm and innovation and they'll get even more bandwidth because you've just sort of unlocked them from that menial, mind-numbing, frustrating task. Andrew, is that something that you guys have seen with with your project is that, you know, by by finding that balance and, and focusing on getting some bandwidth for team, it's really sort of had its own spiral effect or, or, you know, exponential value of bandwidth that's been unlocked? Yeah, it certainly has. I mean, you get to a situation where you don't have, you know, every business unit having to go and create a client file every time someone gets referred from one part to another because you've already got it in the system. It, you know, it frees people up. So, you know, our mortgage assistants get to actually spend a bit of time doing research and due diligence on lending solutions across in the mortgage business. In the financial advice business, if we pick up a new client that may have come from mortgages, we've got half the file built already. Like we, we already yeah. know the information because they've been through a mortgage process. So it means that our financial planning assistants can spend more time uh, doing more value add and sort of moving further up the value chain. Uh, there's a bit of automation that we've been able to focus on as well with things like review meeting bookings and what have you and uh, some intelligence around the way that uh, that gets booked. Uh, it means that we're you know, not just constantly ringing people to book things in. It's all getting sort of automated and, and done and we can spend more time providing advice to clients and talking with our clients. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that initial effort unlocks some bandwidth and then the team sort of run with it and they just keep on doing it. You know, they keep on finding ways to get value. So I'm curious, Nigel, when you – like you've got CNTM now, it's, you know, you have white-labeled something. Advisors can – you've got it to the point actually where it's it's really so well-constructed advisors can take advantage of this for their own practices. Looking back, you know, you had to go to market. You went outside the industry. This was a completely new adventure for you. What do you feel you did well and what did you feel you'd do differently? What did you learn from that process? And if you had to go and do this again, you might be crazy if you did, but if you had to go and do this again for a different piece of tech, you know, what would you do differently? Yeah, it's it's a hard one because, as I said, we went in pretty blind. We thought we had this sort of problem ourselves and then uh, was really spurred on by a client to take it further. So a client used it and said, I think you should sort of take this out to the market and and that sort of um, encouraged us to, to to take it to another level and obviously raise a bit of money to get that tech built. Um, and that was sort of more a curious thing to say, you know, can we solve this problem? Right. Um, but having no real idea where we'll end up, like it wasn't like, hey, we're going to try and list this in the year or something. It was more like, hey, it's a problem we've got. We can use it. Maybe others will use it. Um, and then the surprises along the way. So, the, you know, the, the biggest group using it, which um, is a big um, accounting group, which was not what I'd thought of at the start, you know. Um, um, so it wasn't – we hadn't thought of that, even though I'd sort of come originally from accounting. So that's been really interesting. So I think – I think of all these things, you know, I don't know. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. When you start, when you've got a startup, like we've got a, you know, a full service financial advice business on the side. So that's, it's not like we, um, you know, so that's sort of ticking along and doing its thing. So this has been a, a good to have. And part of the problem probably has been that sort of how, where to spend time and how to allocate right. the time yeah. and the journey with that and the team and getting the, the right people to help in certain parts of it. Um, and just keeping that uh, motivation, to be honest, that, 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 you know, you have some, when you've got a startup, you have some scary moments and go, you know, are we going to get through it? And, um, and, you know, getting those little hurdles along the way. So 
I don't know if we do anything differently, to be honest. I mean, you know, you, you obviously you like going back in time to be perfect, but then we, we didn't know that back then, and that was just yeah. that's just been part of the journey, and we still don't know what's 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 going to happen tomorrow. You know, that's part of the fun of it. You know, we've got some got some good business on board now, but there's still some so, so many big unknowns out there, and the industry is changing so much in front of our eyes. So, um, but I suppose that's what keeps us going. That you know, it's just that curiosity of going, can we um, can we keep at this? Can we solve a problem? And can we survive? You know, <laughs> that's I guess uh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I absolutely. Yeah. I'd imagine one of the interesting things for your, you know, particular particular thing you were trying to solve is, is you know, it was almost as long as a piece of string in that you were just going out and going, wow, there's so many things we could do or implement or tools. I'm betting, though, one of the anchors that probably kept you on track was knowing the problem you were trying to solve. Like having, mm. you're probably yeah. really clear on that's like, this is what we're trying to solve. Let's see what's out there. Um, you know, that probably kept you anchored, um, whereas that can send you asunder, doesn't it, when you sort of start yeah, somewhere but you're a bit point, vague. Yeah. yeah, and actually trying to keep focus on that, on solving that problem, probably have being a bit naive. I mean, I've been in an independent boutique space for now 12 years, so right. actually um, really getting starting to talk to some of the big dealer groups and realising the pain that they've been through and that they just weren't open to new ideas, you know, like <laughs> – so that was a bit nice. Said, hey, we've got this new idea for you. I go, hang on a second. We're, we're still we're still dealing with the last five years. So yeah. some uh, some good lessons there, and realizing you know what's going on in industry and really where people's pain points were, and and us learning well what who who they're for, uh, sort of people who might use this and we should be talking to, and not wasting our time and and modifying that based on the feedback. So. You know, if you had your time again, I suppose, try and do a lot more research up front in terms of the market research. Um, but again, you know, you learn that as you get out there and start start talking to people as well. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Jamie, how about for you? You know, what were the things you felt you guys did really well and what would you, you know, say, look, we've learned from that, but we'd probably do it differently, you know, embarking on a similar yeah, program? I'll learn, yeah, our lessons are definitely don't rush into things. Um, <laughs> you know, if I go back to when I first started the process, as I said, I love signing up to everything, trying to use everything, and and sort of now it's definitely speak to people, have, just have conversations, and and look, the industry and outside the industry is really great. If if you reach out to someone and say, "Can I grab half an hour of your time?" Um, most people would put it in their diaries, and that includes other advisors out there doing things. And I feel like I've built up a really great network now of people I've never even met, um, unless it's via Teams, um, mm-hmm. from all over Australia, where we can have conversations. Um, we can quickly jump on Teams and sort of go, "This is what I'm thinking. What have you sort of found in that regard?" So, um, explore those options. Listen to staff around you, like the. The most interesting part is I actually don't use pretty much, you know, 80% of the technology that we have within the business in my role. So yeah. now when I'm making decisions, I really need to speak to my staff and gain their insights on it um, because if I'm making decisions that I think is a great idea and then, you know, they're the ones that need to use it and it's, you know, becomes an absolute sort of nightmare for them, um, then I haven't done my job properly. So sort of their lessons coming through and then moving forward, it's definitely sort of an open discussion with everyone, um, find bits of technology we like, speak to the right people, you know, because every trial that you – if you speak to a product advisor or a BDM or whoever they are and they show you the bits of technology, I tell you what, it works perfectly every time. (laughs) Um, But, you know, going through that process yourself and saying to use it, there's going to be problems. So, um, yeah, that's probably what I've learned through the process. How about for you, Andrew? What were your sort of lessons or things that you'd – you go, yay, we did this right, but, you know, this thing I probably could, you know, going forward I'd probably do that differently. I think – Particularly for research, you know. Yeah. So Nigel and Jamie really did cover it well. I mean, you're going to make mistakes along the way. It's inevitable. (laughs) Um, The only way to avoid it is to not have a go. But uh, if we do that, we don't make any progress. So we're okay with the fact that, you know, we – we did make some mistakes along the way. There's things that we probably would have done differently uh, if we did you know, did it again, but we couldn't have known that at the time. Um, I, I do agree with Jamie, though. Um, I think trialing software rather than signing up for it uh, because the demos, you're right, they always work. And then when you uh, try and have a crack at it yourself, you find that it doesn't quite work like the demo presented uh, or they, they give you a perfect scenario in a demo and then you try and have a go yourself and it just doesn't quite play out that way. Um, you know, I think we could have done a bit more trial and due diligence before rolling it out to the rest of the team and trying to t- train the team on bits of software before realising, hang on, this probably wasn't the right bit of technology that we've, we've checked here. So um, certainly a bit more trial in that research phase. 
It's an interesting thing too, isn't it? Because, I mean, you know, I host an advice tech podcast. Clearly, I'm curious about tech. So I'm the one that often will do that, you know, trial, 30-day trial thing, which what I've realized, that's a mistake. I I definitely should, but I need to get a member of the team who isn't like me to also try the 30-day trial because I'm naturally going to plow my way through it. You know, I will just keep on clicking and and checking things out. Whereas you need that person that will hit the wall and just go, I don't know where to go now, because that's part of the user experience. You nearly, really need to get a quick sense of how easy is it for somebody to pick this up, because that's a huge part of choosing these systems, isn't it? Is is it going to be something we, like we've got to learn a new language for twelve months for us to be able to use this system? You know, was that something, Jamie, you found? You know, as you've been, you know happily trying all these things out as you've been doing your research? Yeah, and look, our staff, um, you know, if I go back seven years ago, there was probably more resistance to change um, where by engaging staff now and, and, and having them along that journey with me, uh, my staff are great at sort of, you know, uh, relishing the, the test of new technology and and you're right there's i i use technology different to others in here um yeah. and you know i'm probably rushed through things sometimes when i'm using them and you know click next 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 if it doesn't work go back 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 and start again um so yeah it's about actually getting the people that are using them if they can break it in a certain way that's good um you know find where the problems are um and go through that process so then sort of finally, and, and Nigel, I'd love to start with you, given you're actually potentially one of the tech solutions people will be researching, right? So they might be looking for something exactly like you've got there in CNTM. What are your tips for practices to optimize their research process when they're looking at, at new tech? You know, what are the things, is there anything you feel they should be asking or, or checking off or anything like that that you would nudge them towards to really get a sense of this is the right one for them? Yeah, I think there's a few things that have been mentioned today. One is really understanding the problem you're trying to solve, um, and often the the visionary, what we would call, it, is the like the people in this in this podcast are looking <laughs> at all these ideas, and they'll give it a go, and they'll think it's a fantastic idea. So what you're just talking about, Peter, there is getting someone in the team involved really early stage, like the people who are actually going to be doing it, and the people who might think differently and just more practically, um, because a lot of people will get the concept, but then actually the implications of rolling something out or applying it and does that actually work in your business that they're normally the people at, at the cold face the more the the staff are actually saying yeah you're going to give me another system to use this is just frustrating yeah. um are we you know does it can does it make a difference or what are you going to bring us next week so really having i suppose a, a, you know a plan and what you're trying to achieve and then going right this is this is this this is what we think we've seen that out there that might fit in but let's get the team involved from day one because um when we've seen it and we've been talking to, you know, a, a, a principal or someone like that, so we almost know straight away that it's going to take forever. But if they've already got the team on the call, then, then great, they're already engaging them and they understand that problems from the, for the whole, whole benefit of the whole business, not just a, a crazy idea that look good at 10 o'clock at night, you know. It is interesting, isn't it? Because I've got into that habit with even product providers where I'll get the support team on you. You've got a new BDM, they want to, you know, come out and talk to you. And so I'll get the support team because – you know, they can see exactly the same slide as me about something, but because of their role, will pick up on something entirely different. You know, they'll they'll draw something in and go, whoa, 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 what do you mean about that? You know, and so, you know, that applies to tech, doesn't it? So get them, even though they might not be participating in the actual decision, get them to be party to that sort of beauty parade of seeing what things can do because they will pick up on different stuff. You know, their lens is so different. Has that, Jamie, what would be your tips to people who are sort of embarking on this in terms of the research of the different opportunities for tech out there? Yeah, look, I, I think um, when you're at events and things like that as well, listen to what's going on. Um, you know, we changed for a bit of technology because um, my partner actually got up in the morning at a um, at a conference and went to the first session, which no one normally does, and, and found a really good bit of technology to let us on our journey. And sort of we pivoted away from that, but you know, that's a part that I think is really important. Um, I think you know when you're talking about staff, the same thing is. You know, get them to actually have uh, meetings by themselves as well. So I, I, I sort of can have a session with um, a BDM, but then, you know, I'll get sort of one of my other partners and managers to go, hey, you know, you jump on and see what you think and sort of give that responsibility to others as well because um, mm-hmm. you're right, they're going to come back with different opinions um, and then sort of, you know, the, the executive decision might not stay with them um, and they sort of, you know, you might need to implement technology and get everyone on board, but, you know, get others involved without, without me um, in the room. Perfect. And Andrew, last voice for this episode, what would be your tips to any listeners about the research process and things they can do to really make it, you know, worthwhile and get a good result in the end? 
I think you really need to know what your goals are or what is it you're trying to achieve by this new bit of technology because there is so many different pieces of technology out there. Um, I think you've got to be quite careful not just to go jumping at the latest shiny thing that catches your attention and implement it into your, into your, uh, into your business uh, without actually knowing what problem it is you're trying to solve with that bit of technology. Um, so that's probably really the key one is know what your actual objectives are and then assess the tech that you're looking at against how it's going to achieve those objectives. Absolutely. And I mean, it's it's exactly what we do with advice, right? You've got to have the really strong goals, the scope, all of that really clear. And then, you know, it makes it much easier to compare the options for the clients. So that's the same with our businesses, um, which is a perfect way to ra- wrap up. Look, Nigel, Jamie and Andrew, thank you so much for being so willing to talk through your process, you know, some of the hiccups you had and, and the experience that you've had over time. I'm really confident that's going to add some value to the listeners who are either in the middle of considering tech, tech options, but maybe will in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Cheers. All righty. Lots of good stuff there, folks. Now, we're lucky to have Andrew Whelan from Dash back again. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Now, I couldn't let it go. I had to. Um, I want to really wanted to bring up with you, Jamie made the comment about using tech to really lift the spirits of grumpy staff, you know, staff yeah. having to just deal with, and we mentioned in the last, last episode, this re challenge. Have you really seen that where where tech can sort of reinvigorate a practice where everybody feels more on board and energised? Yeah, yeah, that's why we do it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the tech is hard enough that yeah. on its own that if we didn't get a few people that are really happy. So it is really, it's really rewarding when people say, look, this has just helped my business no end and my clients love it. And that's what yeah. I, I particularly like hearing about investors enjoying what it is that we're doing yeah. and having a better experience. Um, it kind of feels like we're working collaboratively. Like advisors get that all the time. It's really yeah. you know, we get to get Well, it's true, isn't it? You know necessarily what I mean? get that far. The feedback doesn't no, get that far. No, so that's nice. Mm. Um, I, I will say that there is a journey Go uh, implementations, yes, so, and, and this sort of leads on to what we were talking about at the end of the last podcast. Mm-hmm. With um, y- you've got to bring the whole people, the whole business Same on level. the journey because yeah. if you don't. Often you can get really good tech, and as good the tech is, someone's going to be grumpy about the shift because yes. there's friction in the shift. Yes. So super rewarding when it happens, but there is almost an inevitable, you know, little dip. Yep. And around the typically around the three month mark, yeah, right, where you're in and you're committed and it's there's like, no going oof. back, and you've, you've perhaps you know not brought everyone on the journey and yep. starting to get some challenging com- conversations happening internally, yeah. So always great when it happens, but they're most regularly, you know, well particularly if not everyone's been brought on the journey, you get it. We we will get both, and then it settles, you know, right. and then everyone everything's clear. And I guess it's a good point because we're already, you know, two steps in here, which is research. The team can be involved at every stage. You can utilize the team and bring them on board to help with the specification, with the fact finding, to really thinking what do we need. And then you can also bring them along the journey on the research. You know, not that Mm. everybody needs to do everything, but to take them on their journey so they almost are running ahead of you. They're ready. You know, the minute that you pick one, they're like, please, we want this because we get why. Yeah. And I think that's what makes why I like the dash model because we don't have to bully people into our stuff. Yeah. You know? Like we're not waiting to speak. Yeah. We can genuinely listening to what people want. And then if a, another module in, uh, in our in our ecosystem, which we will build out hopefully to thousands at some point, yeah. right? like if a, if a bit, one fits the business better, then yeah. – that's that's what we will put forward. So yeah. it, that's um that's always nice is to be able to actually listen rather than right. wait wait to sell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and look, Jamie also mentioned that you know what was interesting for them in their fact finding process, and then when they went started going out to market, is they realised they actually needed less tech potentially mm. than what they had. Do you see that when they, when people go through this process, they're yeah. like, oh, hold on. We've got a lot of stuff everywhere. We can actually yeah. consolidate and narrow this down. Yeah, and and it's it's a that can often be an evolution thing that, that cre- creeps up on you where you get someone in and you come in and you get a piece of tech to solve a particular problem, and then you turn around four years later and you've got six different providers. Yeah. You know what what and none of them speak to each other. And you like someone like someone in the back office likes this one, and you love this for your client meetings, and a different advisor doesn't. So yeah. you could start to. 
um, devolve into <laughs> like a, an ununiform or a non-uniform way of doing business and yeah. is a tech provider for everything. So yeah. we do see that. Um, and then when some discipline comes back into the practice, when someone says calls it and says that's it, we've had enough of this, we're gonna we're gonna all get on the same page and work yeah. something through. Then actually less tech and often less cost uh, result. Right. I mean, and we all love that. Yeah. Right? In this environment, less <laughs> yeah. cost. It's it's an interesting thing that we're talking about too, because I think um, you know less tech also means you can have some core partners core technology partners because mm. there's not as many of them. Mm. And there was some discussion with the guests where it was, okay, we want somebody that's almost at the forefront. We want to be getting new stuff and and all the journey that's going on. And we're all, I mean, I hesitate to use AI. Well, it's not necessary to bring it up necessarily, but there's lots of change. Mm. So they want that, but they also want surety. You know, you don't want to be mm. nine or 12 months in and the tech player doesn't exist anymore is that yeah. something you see people asking about like all we the want time. somebody who's sticking around like no, all the all the time and they should yeah and and you know there are there have been some some really big promises made and businesses that have burned a lot of cash and not been yeah. able to survive so yeah. uh, you know we're really clear in that a lot of lot of technology is pre-profit right, right. so that if you're looking for profitable tech generally you're talking with big players that have yeah. been around for a long time that have their own scars, right? But the sort of questions I think that are really clever is uh, the, to clever to ask technology is: Are you growing? Like, are you right. growing, and how much buy? And make your own assessment about whether or not that's because in tech, and particularly with platform, we're lucky in that we have a platform as well. Yeah, it's a really, really, um, you know, really strong business and yeah. growing all the time. So we yeah. are at Dash. We're really lucky that we we grow we grow quickly so we're able to sort of fend that those questions off and make people feel comfortable yeah um but it's the ones that's the ones that 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 have fallen over the really common thread is they stopped growing yeah and they they stagnated early yeah in their growth um yeah but once you get past a certain point it's um you, you're kind of there to stay and look it is it is hard and, and it's i guess the counterbalance so there's the big players like you're saying okay we want surety and then well, the opportunity is for somebody that's just narrow and deep. They've just got one thing they do really well. Then you can plug and play. Yeah. Then you can like that lets you do that. That's if you've right. Got the core that's stable. Then you can plug and that's play. That's right. And yeah. you can take some risks. Yeah. Some niche players. Yes. Um, which will always be there. That's- which will always be there. And I, and I think it also makes a really like we we integrate with Product Rex, which is free. And right. I actually speak about this is something that would fall over. They've got advisor ratings now. Like they're really yeah. solid. But at the time. It was wild to see how are these guys are going to make money. They're right. free and they're excellent. Right? Yes. So they're great. Yes. Um, but they've got a different model, right? So mm. you've got to ask the questions. How, did you, how do you make the money? Where does it? And it's all around uh, advertising and those things. Yeah. But for us, it wasn't a threat. Right. It, so being free was like because we didn't have to build a module in that place. We could just integrate with them and yeah. we do. And then and then everybody wins. So yes. it's, uh, it's a really interesting time for that. It is, isn't it? It's, and I'd love to see more unusual solutions or just niche solutions come out in the yeah. future. You know, yeah, that's they exciting. Will. They will. When people just, I mean, you know, Nick's done a great job with that. It's just yeah. solve a problem. Yeah. yeah. You please, more of you. So now Nigel's discussion was interesting because in his research process, yeah. bless his cotton socks, he was researching something he had never encountered before, didn't know anything about, like learning management systems. It's not yeah. advice tech as much as it's just tech tech. Um, and had to just go out to market. Like, what a journey to go on. That's quite the experience. Is it something that, I mean, I guess you guys don't see it that much because most people are, are playing within advice tech space, but it certainly was interesting to see how um, how much he had to learn and how quickly. Yeah. Hats off to him right? in terms of that. So particularly because he's running another business, a financial planning business. Yes, yeah. you know that's. Um, he's clearly got forty hours in his day, not twenty-four yeah, like the rest exactly. of us. Exactly. <laughs> no, it's really, it's really, uh, it's a really good point. And what people, and I think it came up a few times in the podcast, is that people will often look to other industries yeah. to see, to get inspiration for what is, um, what is working for yeah. other in other industries. So yeah. often it can be a distraction, but if you can take inspiration and then bring. Bring some um, some outside knowledge in, then all the better. But they've done a tremendous job with that CNTM product, so yeah. he's he's been able to spin that up really quickly and been able to find a good market for it. So, yeah, which the market desperately needs. That C and D client has just been kind of abandoned by the industry. Not, yeah, no fault of the industry, it's been no. regulated out, but um, it's badly badly needed. 
And look, it's like you say, it's um, it is a process, and I, we do this too, where we go outside. Just like it's, it is the inspiration thing. It's well, what else are people doing? Yeah, we're actually a tiny industry. Yeah, in advice, there's yeah. so few of us yeah. that I think going outside challenges our own thinking. It does. But it sounds like even from Andrew's perspective, he still came back into the industry for their selection of a CRM. Which is interesting, and you guys must see that into yeah. Because he 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 landed on micro um, Microsoft Dynamics. Yes, like, so a provider Fin three six five that integrates yes. with ours. So that was cool for his part of the business. But yeah. what he's realised, and what we've realised too, so we're really selective with what we build in our CRM because we're not going to beat Salesforce or Microsoft Dynamics. So Andrew's business is big, 30, 30 people mm. run. So with that comes the need for really streamlined things, embedded telephony, you know, AI yeah. sort of taking notes and all of this sort of stuff can add a real, a lot of value for a big business, less yeah. so for a small business, too yeah. unwieldy. Yeah. Um, so going, and then he's got the other parts of his business as well. So going to like a proper Microsoft product will have, add more flexibility for him. Yes. Um, but might not be the right choice for, for everybody else. Well, for someone who's just this straight financial planning, yeah. You know, then you you can afford to pay less and get a dedicated provider. Yeah, and I mean that's part of the research process, isn't it? It's, it is. it's and understanding the width and the depth of these solutions. Yeah, and which parts of that you need. Yeah, so that then you don't you know buy a bus instead of a scooter. You know, like it's <laughs> really understanding yeah, yeah, your yeah. needs. Yeah. Um, just because and and it, you can get carried away with a whole lot of features you don't need which i mean we're going to jump into then in the next episode you know analyzing your options and then picking one and that's going to come up where it's look how do we make sure we don't get distracted mm. by some shiny stuff so i'll look forward to chatting to you then great